Hello. I can't hear you. Is, is that Florence or Eva? Hi. It's very faint from you. Hi, Brian. Hi, Will. So uh, why the delay in the meeting? Is that because there was another meeting that was preceding? Yes, yes. Oh. Uh, bylaws and we we could not do it um, yesterday because it, it was a holiday. Yep. Okay, well, you're all set. Who's that? It's Eva. Hi, okay. I, I can hear you a little better now. Thanks, Eva. You're all set. Have a good one. Thank you. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Susan. Hi, Wayne. Hey, Will. Hello. It looks like I'm looking away. I'm just looking at my other screen. So. I am um, just pulling up some stuff on my other screen. Um, let's get started. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, for those who, who aren't aware, this is the Quality of Life Committee for Manhattan Community Board 2. Um, this is our monthly meeting. We typically deal with issues uh, including street activities, environmental and sanitation issues. Um, so thanks to everyone who's joined. Um, we have uh, an interesting agenda today. We're gonna start by hearing a presentation from Patrick McClellan, um, who has joined from the New York League of Conservation Voters. Um, so let me introduce him in a second. And then following that, um, we are going to have six different street activities to review. Um, so if you're here presenting one of those street activities, um, we will go in order as it's listed on the agenda on our website. Um, so once I do call you, uh, please call your activity, please raise your hand and we will promote you to a panelist so you can speak. Um, so that's part two of the meeting. And then part three will be a discussion um, of, of our annual district need statement and budget requests um, in those issues that pertain to street activities, environment, um, and sanitation. So anyone from the public who has joined is also welcome to contribute uh, their thoughts at that point as well. Um, so let me quickly introduce who's here from the committee. Um, I am again, I'm the chair of the committee. We have Brian Pape, uh, Susan Kent, Wayne Kowadler, Michael Levine and Rocio Sands who are all committee members. And then I would like to make a special introduction for Joanna Lawton who has joined uh, as our newest public member. Um, we're very excited to have her on board and she has a, uh, a very well-developed background on the environmental side. So we're certainly looking forward to your input and advice. Um, so thanks Joanna. So let's go ahead and go to the first uh, agenda item on our meeting. Um, this is gonna be a presentation from Patrick McClellan, who is the, and please Patrick, tell me if I'm getting this wrong, Director of Policy at the League of Conservation Voters. Um, and he is here to speak about the uh, 2022 statewide ballot proposal number one that's gonna be on everyone's ballot in, in November uh, for the Clean Water, Clean Air and Green Jobs Environmental Bond Act of 2022. Um, so we're going to have a quick presentation from Patrick, and then um, we'll, we'll open the floor for questions after that. So Patrick, once again, uh, thanks for joining, and let me pass it off to you. Thank you, and uh, thanks for inviting me to present this evening. Uh, I appreciate it. So a little bit of background uh, up front. The last time that New York State had an Environmental Bond Act was in 1996, uh, so it's been a while, and uh, the general idea here is to have a much larger sum for capital projects related to the environment than you would otherwise be able to obtain through the normal budgeting process by uh, borrowing the money and bonding it to state revenue. Um, this bond act 
uh, originally passed in 2020 as a $3 billion bond act. Uh, it was then pulled from the ballot in November, which was very unusual, but they, um, Governor Cuomo at the time had inserted a provision uh, into the bond act that was authorized by the legislature, giving um, the director of the budget, who's an administration official, the authority to pull the bond act from the ba ballot if they had worries about the state's finances, which at that time, because of the pandemic, uh, they did because, you know, the um, significant federal aid that New York has received uh, in the last year and a half, none of that had really happened yet. Uh, so they pulled it from the ballot. Uh, it was then reauthorized in 2021, again, as a $3 billion bond act, um, this time with no clawback provision, but setting it on the 2022 ballot. And then finally, this year, uh, which was Kathy Hochul's first budget as governor, um, she came in wanting to increase the size of the Bond Act. The legislature actually wanted to increase it even further. So they went back and forth during the budget process and they settled on $4.2 billion. And so that's the Bond Act that we are all going to have the chance to vote on as Proposition 1 in November, the $4.2 billion uh, clean air, clean water, and green jobs bond act. And the money is broken down into a couple of different pots of funding that I'll go through kind of high level here. So uh, the biggest pot of money is at least $1.5 billion for climate change mitigation. After that, the next biggest pot of money is one is at least $1.1 billion for um restoration of natural areas and flood risk reduction. And then at $650 million uh, each, there is a pot of money for water quality and resilient infrastructure uh, and a pot of money for open space conservation and recreation. Um, and there is also a requirement that 40% of the Bond Act's funds benefit disadvantaged communities. Um, that's something that has been pushed for by environmental justice organizations nationwide and is increasingly becoming the gold standard for environmental legislation is to make sure that we're trying to correct environmental racism um, by sort of righting the wrongs that have been inflicted on disadvantaged communities over the years. So uh, in this case, that's $1.4 billion uh, of this that will go towards disadvantaged communities of which we of course have uh, unfortunately a great many in New York City. So is that Patrick, is that precisely yep. defined in the act how they define a disadvantaged community? So it was I uh, it's it's been a very long process, but it was actually first defined in the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which passed in 2019 and is New York's um, landmark climate law. It requires us to cut um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions economy wide 85% by 2050. Uh, with a requirement that the remaining 15% of emissions that are not uh, eliminated be offset. Um, and in that law that set, you know, this 40% for disadvantaged communities standard, it did not define disadvantaged communities. It set that as a task for what was called the climate justice working group, which was appointed by um, the governor and legislative leaders. They have been meeting since then. Um, this is parallel to another process that's been going on to create the implementation plan for the, the climate law. Um, and so they published a draft definition of disadvantaged community, which went down to the census tract level um, earlier this summer and um, uh, closed comments on that, public comments, I believe in August. And the final definition uh, should be out by December 31st. If you're interested in seeing the draft uh, maps of disadvantaged communities, which again, it's it's not final. We expect that there will be changes, but um, you know, if you wanna see if your census tract is in the draft definition, you can go to climate.ny.gov um, and find those maps there. Thank you, that's, that's very interesting, thank you. Yeah, so within those pots of money that I mentioned, um, just some more specifics here. So the climate change mitigation uh, fund is the largest one, one and a half billion dollars. Um, and within that, $500 million has been set aside for zero emission school buses. This is because uh, New York City and now New York State as well uh, have laws on the books requiring all school buses in the state uh, to be fully zero emission by 2035. 
that's an expensive undertaking right now. We expect that by the end of the decade, there'll be cost parity between electric school buses and diesel school buses. And so, you know, there won't be a special cost associated with purchasing those buses, but for now they are more expensive and you also have to make investments in uh, charging infrastructure at bus depots. So um, recognizing that this is an expensive proposition that it would not be fair to expect school districts to uh, you know, bear the brunt of, uh, there's $500 million for zero emission school buses in the Bond Act. There's also $400 million for green buildings. This includes things like energy efficiency retrofits uh, and on-site uh, on uh, renewable energy. Uh, and the catch here is that only public buildings are eligible for this funding. So um, anything that's owned by the state, anything that's owned by SUNY or CUNY, uh, and any public school in the state. Um, so that's really great because, you know, on-site emissions from dirty boilers and furnaces, for instance, are actually a pretty major source of local air pollution. And obviously we don't want our children going to school in buildings that are, um, you know, falling apart and emitting all kinds of nasty things that uh, contribute to asthma and other respiratory illnesses. Uh, and then there is also money in here for climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, and so that would be things like open space, community gardens, uh, uh, cool roofs and green roofs, urban forestry, um, those sorts of, uh, you know, investments that we, we can make that make the extreme weather that uh, is being caused by climate change a little bit easier to deal with. Uh, in the natural uh, areas restoration and flood risk pot of money, this is the $1.1 billion. Uh, $100 million is set aside for coastal rehabilitation and shoreline restoration. Um, a lot of the work that has been done on Staten Island since Hurricane Sandy would fall into this bucket, as well as a little bit of the work that's been done in Queens. Uh, at least $100 million to reduce inland flooding and revitalize waterfronts. This is really mostly for um, like riverfront communities and canal front communities upstate um, that have dealt with a lot of extreme flooding over the last decade or so, uh, and then $250 million for flood buyouts. And so again, that's something that was utilized extensively in Staten Island and Long Island after Hurricane Sandy of recognizing that there are some areas that no matter how much money we invest, we're, we're not going to be able to protect from sea level rise. And so working with the community to, um, to do what's called managed retreat from those areas that we can't really protect. Um, in Manhattan, what this might take the form of, of the natural area restoration um, would be things like uh, oyster reefs in the rivers um, that you know similarly help with um, protecting the waterfront. The kinds of mega projects that have been talked about to protect uh, Manhattan from future storm surge are so large in scale that they're kind of outside the scope of the Bond Act. Those are more things that you would look to um, you know, the federal infrastructure bill that passed last year to be a source of funding for, um, but you would still expect Manhattan to be eligible for some of the, um, the sort of underwater stuff that's going on to protect our ecosystems and that will uh, sort of help at the margins with, with rising sea levels and certainly will help with water quality as well. Uh, and then I'll just kind of zoom through these, these last two so that I can get to any of your questions, but uh, water quality improvement and resilient infrastructure. This is mostly for wastewater. Uh, this is $650 million. It's mostly for wastewater infrastructure and uh, stormwater uh, infrastructure. Um, and, you know, upstate there, there are issues with um, like harmful algal blooms in some of the water sources. That's not really an issue with uh, the New York City reservoirs, uh, knock on wood. Um, so in the city, this would be um, more like green infrastructure or um, some of the minor piping projects to try to reduce combined uh, sewer overflow, which is um, you know one of the main sources of ongoing water pollution in the city when we have a heavy rain and um, you know our sewage is flushed out into the rivers. So this would help with some of those projects. Again, not the um, not the mega engineering projects that sometimes get kicked around, but a lot of the smaller scale projects that the Department of Environmental Protection undertakes to improve um, uh, water quality in the city and protect us from, from sewer overflow, those types of projects would be eligible uh, for funding here. Uh, yeah, Pat, and then, Patrick, yep. I, I was gonna go ask ahead. on that one. I mean, 
we I we have very little, you know, I think what's officially termed green infrastructure in our mm -hmm. district. There's a map that the DEP has that you can look at. Um, and there's almost nothing in lower Manhattan that's termed green infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So I, I could be small, you know, something like a small rain garden or something like that, any kind of minor project that would in some of the areas that have seen, you know, heavy flooding, um, inland flooding really during during Ida and some of those other storms that brought a lot of rain. I mean, could that for an, be an example of something that would fall under this portion? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, green infrastructure like that, you know, bioswales on the street, uh, green roofs on, yeah. on building rooftops, um, other projects like that. I mean, even if there were um, an existing park that were, uh, you know, a major uh a uh, tool for, for preventing stormwater runoff if there were like improvements that the parks department wanted to make that would okay. uh, enable it to do an even better job of capturing stormwater before it gets to the water, um, uh, gets to the waterfront or into the sewer, sewer system. Um, those types of projects could be eligible here. Um, and I think, you know, the thing that we, we won't know until the Bond Act is approved, um, which again, not, knock on wood, assuming that it is approved, uh, are the rules for eligibility and who is eligible to apply. All of that will be decided by okay. the State Department of Environmental Conservation and what's called the Environmental Facilities Corporation, which is their kind of grant making apparatus, uh, you know, to, to figure out essentially, is it just going to be municipal governments that are eligible to apply for this? That probably will not be the case or what types of non-governmental actors will be eligible to apply in terms of you know local community groups um, and things like that you know would a for instance would a business improvement district be eligible to apply for some funds for for those types of green infrastructure projects that's unclear at this point it would have to be determined through state rulemaking uh after the the bond act is approved okay yeah, that was going to be sort of a whole line of questions that I had, but it's uh, anyway, it sounds like it's not finalized and I'll, I'll let you finish as well. Sorry. For yeah. Oh, no, that's OK. Um, and so then just the the last thing here was six hundred fifty million dollars for open space conservation and recreation um, upstate. That's going to be, you know, a lot of farmland protection uh, and building out nature preserves and things like that. Uh, in the city, that would be more uh, support for uh, parks and playgrounds and things like that, um, and other, you know, um, I'm trying to find the right phrase for it, but sort of nature-centric uh, activities. So, you know, again, that can be taking existing parks and, and approving them, making necessary capital repairs, um, you know, connecting them with green corridors to other green space, or it could be constructing entirely new parks in, uh, in parts of the city that, um, you know, don't have equitable access to parkland. Um, so that's the, that's the breakdown of it. You'll notice um, if uh, you were writing any of it down that the numbers don't, that I threw out there don't add up to $4.2 billion. Um, that's because there is leeway built in um, both for the Department of Environmental Conservation's overhead, but also to uh, shift money around between those things, those different buckets of funding, um, because the totals that I mentioned are minimums that are set in the law. So it's you know at least 1.5 billion, at least 1.1 billion. And then with that remaining, um, I believe it's $250 million that's unaccounted for, um, the state will have some discretion to decide you know, if, uh, for example, the uh, uh, the water fund has you know many more worthy applications than they had initially planned for. They would have some some additional money that they could move into that pot to you know make sure that more of those projects get funded. Um, so that's the kind of top line overview. But I, I'd be happy to um, answer any questions that folks have or go into more detail on any any aspect of it that I mentioned. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Patrick. And um, others on the committee, please feel free to chime in with questions. Um, I, I had a number of questions, as I mentioned, sort of about how it's going to be allocated, but it sounds like there might not be much info. I mean, is there is there even sort of a broad, you know, geographic sort of allocation? Is there a sense of, you know, how much is going to be coming to the city? Uh, I guess it's going to depend on each category. Um, 
so maybe we don't have that yet. But I mean, is there any sense sort of, of the, you know, of the 4.2, how much of it's sort of directed downstate or at Manhattan or other parts of the city? There's nothing required in the Bond Act. There had actually been um, considerable debate in the legislature about whether or not they should include uh, minimum set-asides for each region of the state, and they ultimately decided not to. Uh, but a lot of times with, with these types of funding programs for the state, it comes down to who's applying for it. And very often the city of New York uh, doesn't go out for this money because our budget is so large on its own that very often they sort of um, can be guilty of turning their noses up at state funding that's there if they apply for it. So honestly, the biggest thing to, uh, for making sure that the city gets its fair share of the Bond Act is to make sure that um, you know, city council members and agency representatives know that this money is out there and are actually going through the work of applying for it. Okay. Um, thank you. And then an another question I had is I, I was you know, reading through um, some of what's been put out there. Um, there was also this 8.7 billion number thrown out there, which basically was saying, you know, 4.2 billion of the Bond Act will actually sort of um, anchor 8.7 billion in project spending. Can yeah. you just talk about how that, how that, where that number comes from? Yeah, so that was from uh, a study that our uh, our coalition, um, the uh, uh, Vote Yes Coalition um, Commission from AECOM in February, um, it, they basically estimated that the spending would support uh, 84,000 jobs across the state um, and generate a total of $8.7 billion in project spending. Um, and that would mostly come from uh, from local and state matches. So local matches in the sense that most of this money will not be, um, you know, pay the state is going to pay for 100% of this project cost. Uh, you know, the, any municipal government that applies for funding under the Bond Act will be expected to uh, have some skin in the game as well. Um, and typically those formulas are predetermined by the state and have, you know, various hardship provisions in them as well. Um, but it also would be combined with other state spending. If you're looking at something like water infrastructure where the state already spends $500 million a year in capital funding, um, you would certainly expect any of the you know, clean water funding that's approved under the Bond Act to supplement at least some of that spending rather than being on a completely separate track. So that's kind of where that money comes from is that the idea that it's going to support a lot of other spending where uh, you know, if a municipal government has, say, uh, $5 million to spend on a project that's going to cost $10 million, um, that project wouldn't happen in the absence of the Bond Act because they don't have that other $5 million that they need. Whereas if they get that $5 million from the Bond Act, now there's a $10 million project that's going forward with all of the, uh, you know, knock-on economic benefits uh, that, that accrue when, you know, you have $10 million of government spending in one place. I see. Okay. Uh, let me give someone else a chance to talk. Um, Michael, did you have a question? Yes, real quick. I may have missed this, but is there any money allocated for flood mitigation measures such as floodgates or berms or any of the more serious considerations in New York Harbor? Is any of that in any of the Bond Act here, or is that just too expensive? It's too expensive. Um, yeah, I mean, though, some of the projects that have been talked about from the, the Army Corps of Engineers study uh, would take up like the entirety of the Bond Act if you were to, to put Bond Act spending into them. So um, I think the idea here is to, to tackle more small scale projects, um, which is not to say that there aren't uh, flood mitigation projects in the city that will still benefit from this, just that the ones that will are going to be a bit more neighborhood specific rather than um, you know, harbor wide or waterfront wide, like some of the other post Sandy projects that have been discussed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but for the for the hat study, which just came out, the proposal by the Army Corps, it's something around fifty billion, um, and you know, the state and local portion of that is like thirty five billion or something like that. So anyway, it's 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 pretty big numbers. Um, Wayne, did you have a question? 
Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for this presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, can you just say, is this sort of an, uh, is there a precedent for the, um, for us to be voting on a bond act like this? And has this happened before? Or is this like a new thing and? Yeah, so there was an environmental bond act in 1996, which uh, I wanna make sure that I get the number right. I believe that it was a billion dollars, but I was wrong. It was a $1.75 billion bond act in 1996. That was approved by voters um, who funded uh, a significant number of projects over the next 20 something years. There's actually still a few million dollars left from that in DEC's capital accounts. Um, and we had actually before that in uh, 1990, sorry, I'm trying to make sure I get that. In 1994, when Mario Cuomo lost his reelection bid to George Pataki, he had actually run on an environmental bond act, um, betting essentially that um, turnout from voters who cared about the environment and were enthusiastic about voting on a bond act would boost his reelection uh, campaign. It ended up being the inverse that so many people came out to vote against Mario Cuomo that that bond act also failed, unfortunately, and uh, somewhat spooked people. But you know, fortunately, just a, a couple of years later, we did the 1996 bond act as well. So there, there is historical precedent in New York for doing this. Great. Well, good luck. I hope this passes. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that or not. <laughs> And I just I just looked it up while, while you were asking that question. And to correct what I was saying earlier, I had the, the Army Corps number flipped. It's the 35 percent state and local, 65 federal, but it still comes out to about 18 and a half billion on, on their latest proposal. Um, Brian. Yes, uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I was getting the impression from you that some of the money could be spent for uh, retroactively to pay for previous work done on different conservation work. Is that true? Probably not. Um, it, it will be dependent on the rules that DEC establishes for the funding uh, after the Bond Act is approved, assuming that it is. But generally speaking with things like this, the funding is not available retroactively. Um, it's not out of the realm of possibility, um, but I, I would not think that it's likely. Thank you. So let me just ask, Patrick, um, is there anything that, in your opinion, was obviously left out of this? Um, like, is there anything that was being talked about that didn't make it up into the act in the end? Just so as we think about, you know, funding going forward, is there anything obvious that maybe was didn't make the cut into this bill? Sorry, yeah, that's maybe a tough question. These were not necessarily things that were part of the, the debate about this, but I think that if you were going to do a uh, Environmental Bond Act part two, a few years down the line, I think the two things that you would probably look at are green buildings, outside of publicly owned ones, and also even for publicly owned ones, dramatically increasing the scale because, um, you know, with the with the building stock that we have in the city of older buildings, um, you know, figuring out how to decarbonize them is, is um, pretty tricky and is going to be very expensive. I think it's one of the great challenges that we have in achieving our climate change goals. Um, and the other thing would be more money for transportation. Um, you know, five hundred million dollars for clean school buses is uh, is fantastic. I mean, it's it's more than we were hoping for. Um, but you know, you could also look at public transit fleets like like MTA buses. Um, you know, you could look at charging infrastructure. You could look at um, you know micro mobility. Um, you know, a number of European countries have rebates for new bikes uh, and, and things like that that we don't have in the U.S. Um, you know, there, there are a number of things on in the transportation sector that I think that you could look at that weren't really part of the conversation here. So uh, going back to like the green buildings point, mm -hmm. so something like uh, local law 97, where you have private buildings having to come into compliance with this and cut carbon emissions, there's nothing in this for them. It's only it's only public buildings. 
Uh, public buildings are covered by local law 97 if they're above right. the size threshold in the law. But yeah, for privately owned ones, yeah, there isn't for, anything for those in privately this. owned buildings, yeah, they're having that's to comply right. with it. Okay. That's right. Um, no other questions, Michael? No, sorry. Okay. Um, well, I, I guess I would open it up if anyone else on this meeting has a question. Uh, please raise your hand. Otherwise, we can, we can let Patrick go. Um, I don't see anything. So um, thank you so much for your time. I thought this was very informative. Um, and we really appreciate you coming. Um, well, we have actually we see we have one question from the public. So let me uh, Jeffrey okay. has a question, I think, and then and then we'll let you go, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm looking for a reason for my community, community board two, to be voting for this bond act. And I hadn't actually heard one that's cleared it up for me. I'm kind of uh, what are we going to get specifically here in lower Manhattan and, and not the broader lower Manhattan, but the village? Uh, that would make me want to vote for this bond act because I do worry about the the money that the state has, and so um, I want to vote for it because I'm I believe in green. I love you know it's great, but it sounds to me like uh, we're not actually going to get anything out of it. Am I mistaken? Yeah, I mean I think we can't say for sure which now we cannot say for sure right now which projects specifically are going to be funded by this because again it will depend on who applies. Uh, and then you know who's who's approved by the state, um, but generally speaking, the types of projects in community board two's catchment area that would be covered by this would be things like uh, public parks that are in need of some TLC. Uh, for public schools, you could put solar panels on the roof or green roofs in uh, green infrastructure projects that help with flooding from. Uh, intense rainstorms, which we're seeing a lot more of in New York. Um, uh, that would certainly be helpful. Um, again, for publicly owned buildings, which there are an awful lot of in the city, um, when you're doing energy efficiency retrofits, you're improving air quality for the whole neighborhood, um, public schools in particular, uh, and again, especially in Manhattan, um, tend to be pretty old, which means that they their on-site emissions from heating and cooling the building are uh, are oftentimes not great. Uh, they're often still using fuel oil, uh, heating oil, rather than um, natural gas. And, and certainly, I, I think you could probably count on one hand the number of schools in the city that are using zero emission heating and cooling. And so, when you you know make those kinds of retrofits, you're not just helping that school building, you're improving air quality for the entire neighborhood. And that's true for, uh, for CUNY facilities that could benefit from this as well. Um, but, you know, so I, I think the two things I would say are uh, schools and publicly owned buildings having those, uh, those air quality improvements, uh, and then the, the parks and green infrastructure benefits as well. Well, thank you. At least I now have a reason possibly to vote for it, because if they build the bleaker school uh, where Morton Williams is, maybe we can make them put solar panels on the roof, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. And and Patrick, what I, I mean, what I'm hearing, I think, from you is there are certain niches and pockets of this where we can get funding, but we really need to be on top of it and be on top of our electeds to make sure we actually see our share of that funding. Um, it, yeah, I mean, I, I think for for example, you know, if you have, um, you know, a, a park that's in disrepair or uh, a site that folks think is a good candidate for a community garden that you know has not been turned into one yet, and the city's response to you is we don't have the funding for it, who's going to pay for it? You know, you can say, have you thought about applying for Bond Act funding? Like, look, here's the application; I'll print it out for you. Um, and I think that's really something that all of us are going to have to stay on top of city government uh, to do, yeah. you know, again, assuming that this passes. And Joanna, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add another thought to that. I think Patrick really nailed all the um, very specifics of how this could benefit, but also like 
zooming out, what's really monumental about this is that New York could set the precedent that we hope other states would follow as well. And so just generally considering, you know, your neighborhood's vulnerability to flooding, um, it's not something that New York can really address alone anyway. It needs to come with investments from other states. So hopefully the success of this will inspire others to follow suit. And so we can start actually getting the the meaningful change that we need. Absolutely. I will also say, uh, if you like oysters, um, investing in coastal restoration in Long Island is very important. So there are projects that could be funded in other parts of the state that would still um, benefit us. And I think particularly on some of the, the farms and marine life uh, conservation issues, you know, this is literally the stuff that we eat and, you know, need to survive. And, and so there are projects that, you know, might be 100 miles from here um, that are that are covered by the Bond Act that would still benefit us. Patrick, is there is there a way that we can be informed of kind of when when the um, application process opens? I guess, should we just be tracking this online and stay on top of it that way? Do we have a any idea when when that's going to start? I uh, there would be nothing stopping DEC from starting it as soon as the election is certified. Um, yeah. My guess would be that it will probably take them a little bit longer than that. I I would think uh, the rulemaking will probably happen over the winter, and I would be surprised if the application process uh, starts before the spring. Although I I could certainly be wrong on that. Um, so, you know, I think the time that I would really start looking out for news on this would be like January, February. Okay. Patrick, I just thought of another question. What will mm -hmm. we see on the ballot? Is it one vote or more than one vote? So one, it's- One with the, po the polling group. <clears throat> So it's, it's proposition one um, on your ballots. It will just be the one question about the Bond Act. I believe that there are three other ballot questions related to the New York City Charter um, that you'll see as well. Um, I haven't seen a sample ballot for New York City yet though. So I'm not sure, uh, I don't think they've printed them. So I, I'm not sure um, what exactly the ballot will look like, uh, but this will have a, basically paragraph paragraph length description of what the bond act is and then you know have bubbles to fill in yes or no thank you okay um thanks patrick uh once again thanks for the time um feel free to drop yeah. off we really appreciate it and hope we hopefully we'll stay in touch all of us Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. And uh, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have uh, any other questions. Thank, Thank you. you. So we're going to um, go ahead and move on to the next portion of our meeting, uh, which is street activities. Um, so um, thank you to all the applicants who are who have uh, been sitting through that and waiting, waiting patiently. And now we're going to go on to you. Um, so again, please raise your hand as an attendee and I'll promote you. Uh, if I call the event that you're here for. So we're gonna go in order as it's listed on our agenda. The first is uh, October 23rd, Financial Times phone booth, Gansevoort Pedestrian Plaza. Um, is anyone here for that event? I don't think we got a response um, from them on this one. So I wouldn't be surprised if this one's a no-show. We did send three emails, I think, to everyone. Um, okay, I, I don't see anyone raising their hand for that. So um, we'll put that as a no-show. Um, okay, our next, our next agenda item is um, October 31st through November 1st, uh, Moxie Hotel Lower East Side. Brian? Hello, everyone. Hi, Brian. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, so if you if you wouldn't mind just giving kind of a brief overview of what you're planning, and then um, we'll open it up to the committee for any questions. Sure. Thanks so much. 
Um, the first thing that I did want to point out is that uh, on the agenda, it still indicates um, our desire to, to permit Bowery as well, but um, we've adjusted some of the logistics um, <clears throat> and believe that we're only going to require or need to permit uh, Broom Street on the south side um, and a, a curb lane for pedestrian access. So, so Bowery is, is no longer required. Um, it would just be <clears throat> the Broom Street area. Um, it's going to be the, an opening event for the new uh, Moxie Hotel on the Lower East Side. Um, and we expect to have uh, a red carpet, uh, step and repeat, press pit, um, and uh, about a 300 to 350 person um, party um, that's going to be um, going from about nine um, till about 2, 3 a.m. Um, with setup of the red carpet step and repeat um, and press pit, obviously starting earlier and then breakdown done um, sometime early in the morning of the first. Um, can you can you give kind of a few more details about sort of the itinerary, the specific itinerary? Sure. <clears throat> um, I would imagine the um, the carpet uh, and the press wall would probably begin being built um, sometime around late morning, early afternoon. Um, <clears throat> With the door, the door to the actual event itself um, being nine o'clock, uh, a nine o'clock invite. Um, the event itself is going to take place in the lower uh, level, cellar level um, of the venue. We're opening uh, five venues, um, food and beverage outlets within the hotel. Um, the restaurant is called Sake no Han. It's a traditional, or I should call it modern Japanese uh, restaurant. Um, and um, this is going to be the, the first event. It's a showcase event and an opening event um, and, and Halloween event all rolled into one. Okay. Um, and is there, is there any, so people are showing up, it starts at nine, um, the events inside, but people are going to be arriving, I guess, for some time. I mean, what, when do you expect kind of most people to arrive and by what time are you expecting um, you know, sort of most people to um, be inside the venue, I guess. Sure. <clears throat> so from from the, the past um, times we've done these, and this is our, I think our 18th um, particular party like this, we, we did the Moxie um, East Village in 2019 pre-COVID. Um, most of the main arrivals are in um, by midnight. Most of the, the, the large amount of people are in by midnight. Um, so I would say that the, the main rush would be probably 10 to 1130. Um, and then at that point, once those people are in the, the press leaves, uh, and that a lot, when the press leaves a lot of, um, you know, any on, onlookers would be, um, would leave with them. Um, we'll have the, the whole front secure. We've got over 25 security guards on duty. The precinct is aware. Um, they've been tracking it for um, some time now. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And as people are putting it in the chat, I, th I think what happened here with this event is, you know, Bowery is the border of our, of our district. So we had this come to us, um, you know, I guess given the, that part of it was originally supposed to be Bowery between Broom and Grand, uh -huh. that would have triggered um, notification for both CB2 and CB3 um, since that's the border line. Um, but if you're moving it and not going to be on Bowery at all, it actually does really fall outside of our jurisdiction um, uh -huh. at that point. Okay. So um, now that you're moving it, I think it's sort of less relevant for us to be reviewing it. So sorry, sorry uh, again for that, but um, it would have been relevant, I think, if you were still on Bowery, just because that's the border. Yep. Um, but if you're saying that the event has been changed within the SAPO system, I think it's sort of moot at this point. Um so I'm here with Joe, our uh, director yeah. of security. <clears throat> uh, it, there is a chance that there would be some drop off um, of, you know, cars on Bowery, um, yeah. although we don't foresee a, a permit for that. Um, so I don't know if that's an issue that we need to address with um, CB2. I think I'm okay on that. Um, 
have you heard from anyone on CB3? I'm not sure if they review Street Events in the exact same way that we do. No, we got the CB2 um, yeah. uh, email right away. Um, yeah. but I haven't seen anything from, from CB3. Okay. Should um, I reach out to the I, um, permit office? Yeah, I mean, so uh, not every CB reviews every event, so it, it differs from CB to CB. Um, I, I think we can just leave it there. I mean, I think uh, with the new location, um, I don't think we need to spend any more time on this, unless anyone else has disagrees. Okay. Um, well, thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks sure. again for joining and, and sticking on. We appreciate it. Our pleasure. All right. All thanks, right. guys. Let's move on to the next event. Um, we have the Visit Savannah Tourism event. Hi, Sean. Hello, thank you everyone for having us tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining. So uh, yeah, similar to the last one, if you could just start out by giving us an overview um, you, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen as well, um, with just the picture that you sent. Yeah. I was just going to ask if you were able to share that. It's probably easier if I could just walk people through the customer ex or the guest experience, but, uh, I'm here on behalf of visit Savannah tourism, and we're doing an activation in November where we're pretty much just picking up Forsyth park in Savannah. And we want to bring it to the Gansevoort Plaza. Uh, we're bringing some art, some food, some culture with us. I really want kind of the New York city pe local people to experience what a day might be like when they come down to see Savannah, Georgia. So that's one of two photos. Do you want me to show that one or the other one? That one's perfect. I can actually walk okay. through. Uh, this one's a lot easier to walk through, but as you're facing the tent, um, on the left-hand side there, you see the wooden kind of square. That's where we're uh, planning on having some live music. It'll be very light uh, acoustic guitar, not very amplified sound. Um, no, no big, you know, rock and rolls or anything like that. It's just gonna be nice, easy ambient sound, singer songwriter type of genre. To the right where you see that is we're going to have a, a, a oyster shucking station to kind of represent the coastal cuisine of savannah georgia and these two activations out front will actually kind of go uh, hand in hand so we're going to have two or three sets of either the state of the music and then in between the other two or three sets between our 10 to 6 duration the oyster shucking will happen so they're not going to happen simultaneously out front it'll only be one at one time so then as you walk through our, our footprint here to the left, we'll kind of start with the left. Uh, there's going to be kind of a, a, a stand for food and beverage. So we're going to bring some creative mocktails, but we're also going to feature some Southern staples of sweet tea, lemonade, and then offer some fried green tomatoes, uh, some pralines, and we're going to have some nice snacks for everybody just to really show off our Southern cuisine. And then as you kind of move around up back to the back section there, uh, it's an interactive wall. So we really want people to kind of engage with, with, our, with our theme. And we've asked the question of, when you travel, I like to. And we've kind of just left it open for people to kind of share what their thoughts are about travel. And uh, it's kind of more of a social media play for us just to get people's thoughts and to kind of interact with our guests. We go along the back side there to the back right, and we're actually going to have a local Savannah, Georgia muralist um, present a mural um, of hopefully the local sites and sounds and for people to engage with and have a photo spot with. Uh, back there also, we're going to have like an interactive kind of Instagram wall, if you will, where it's essentially going to be a painting with a park bench that's going to be wrapped uh, by the muralist as well. And it's going to be kind of a photo spot so people can interact with it back there in the back corner. The front spot there you see is actually going to be our, our information booth and our we're going to have a calligraphy station where we're going to offer actually luggage tags if people kind of wander around they're going to get a personalized luggage tag with with a calligrapher who can provide their name and date and kind of any special memento or if they want to address it to anybody as a gift that's going to be the calligraphy station. And then the big key piece in the middle you see, and this is our kind of our hero piece, is we're going to have a 12 foot steel fabricated oak tree. So it's kind of our wow factors right when you walk in, you're really going to feel like you're in the middle of a, of a, a Forsyth Park in Savannah, Georgia. And so with this activation, I know it's kind of a lot to walk through, but um, we really, you know, I think as we position this, we looked at Gansevoort in the area, it really blends well with, with the demographic, the audience, the food and beverage, and the art that's surrounding it. And uh, obviously, we wanted to kind of leverage the cobblestone streets as well, as that's a big, big play in Savannah, Georgia. So we really think this, this spot is a great spot for our activation. Um, 
Okay, thank you. And sure. can you just clarify the just the the, the runtime of this single day? Single day, November twelfth. It'll be from ten a.m. to six p.m. Okay. And but you're going to start the setup on yes. the tenth, and so the eleventh is a full setup day. Yeah. So actually, well, the way we've kind of working with SAP is if with on the 10th that we could build start loading in the 10th because the 11th is veterans day and it's a holiday so not a lot of vendors and people will be able to deliver okay. um, essentially we're kind of hamstrung by the holiday there we couldn't get all loaded in on friday to be open for saturday so we might have a like a day and a half load in between thursday and friday and then our load out will be completely gone by 6 a.m on sunday okay and then this this structure it's 60 by 60 Correct. Yeah, that's the total footprint. So the structure is not 60 by 60. Our total footprint is 60 by 60. And so including the exterior ballast that you don't see here, the weights and the anchors. Okay. And we've, we've been in communication with the great team at the Gansevoir Plaza to help us out with kind of the specs of the site as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I don't know off the top of my head how what the size of the plaza is, but it's I assume this is taking up most of the plaza. Is that right? I believe the way we've mapped it out with the, with the Gansevoort team is we've allowed it for about five to six feet on the outside of the structure for pedestrian traffic along all ways. So people will still be able to walk around our footprint. Okay. But so essentially that, that there's just a walking path around the outside. It's taking up all of all of the seating and everything is removed from the plaza well so we that's that's one of the issues that we are topics that we've talked about with the Gansevoir plaza team and how we can re, we can keep some of the tents and the umbrellas and seating for some for public seating and we can keep that and really interact with the people through uh, our activation without moving those tables so that's kind of our goal is to keep the public seating as much as possible right okay five to six yeah okay i'm trying to envision how that would work but okay um and then i uh, i i saw that you had something on the sapo application um for a horse drawn carriage variance yeah that's out of the question we we're not okay. in the carriage anymore yeah <laughs> that's, that's a new one for me yeah we <laughs> um, we're just getting creative there for a little bit but uh, no that the creative the, the carriage is no longer part of the activation although it would have been a great sight to have the horse run down the street <laughs> <laughs> yeah um okay and then is there is there still a plan to have alcoholic beverages served Can no sir no, we're gonna, no yeah we're, we've kind of omitted the alcoholic beverages we've um it seems like that's not allowed on the grounds and we want to make sure that we're compliant with that so we've changed our alcoholic beverages to mocktails okay um Okay, let, let me um, let me take this down for a second so I can so I can see people. Sure. And if you'd like to share the other image, that's fine. That's that's fine as well too. Yeah. Let, let me open it up, uh, Michael. Go ahead. Well, my only question is, if it's five feet of clearance on each side, where would there still be room for benches and chairs and umbrellas that the plaza normally has? So is there yeah. only five feet on all four sides of the structure available? Mm -hmm. Correct. So we, we've had, we'd have enough room for the pedestrian traffic based on the regulations of the application where we're kind of looking to move the tables and the seats would be to that Eastern kind of that smaller strip. So we would relocate the tables around the, the, the tent. The tent would be facing East on the plaza. And so there will be room for pedestrians as well as seating and the tents, right? Correct, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll make sure to work with the Gansevoort team to make sure that happens. Okay. Thank you. Right, but I mean, it's not going to be a hundred, a hundred percent of the seating. It's going to be some portion of the seating will try to be preserved, right? Correct. Yes, I would. I would imagine that with some, that wouldn't be a hundred percent capacity once we get the tent down. But we were, like I said, we would work with the Gansevoort team to maximize the public seating. And we're also kind of working alongside, we want to work with some community partners too. So we're in conversation actually for kind of a, a partnership, beverage op partnership with Maluska there, the restaurant and bar. So we want to make sure that we're kind of working with the community partners as well. Nothing solidified. We're just kind of still in conversation, but it's not one of the things we want to obviously use with that in that area. Okay. Would that be, would that be, for, okay. So for supply of some of the food? Correct. Yeah. Food, drink, beverages, okay. kind of that. that. Yeah. And then being so close, it's a, it's a nice pie in for us. 
but like I said, not nothing solidified with them yet. Um, in terms of people visiting the structure, I mean, is it are people making reservations? Do you envision there being a line? How so this, how are you managing that? Yeah. So excuse me, the, my delay on the internet over here. So uh, the, the it's free to the public. It's open. It's not an invitation. There's no cost. There's no ticket. Um, it is open as a, a kind of a surprise and delight opportunity. Um, we're expecting probably around two to four hundred people throughout the day. Hopefully, we you know we hope to reach five, but our realistic goal is around four four hundred people from ten to six p.m. Uh, and and like I said, it's it's open to the public. Where there's going to be a little bit of a social media promotion ahead of it, but nothing, no no invitations, no like I said, nothing, no private event, um, no corporate sponsors of any kind. Okay, so there's no. There's no other advertising other than for the city of Savannah, essentially. That's correct. Um, and then have you hired any private security for this? We will, yes. Yes, once we get confirmed, we will have security. Uh, and we're going to have the security on site from the time that we load in overnight security all the way through the activation. Okay. And then um, in terms of, in terms of uh, from a sanitation perspective and waste, is there anything specific you're doing there? Are you going to have your own um, trash receptacles or anything like that? So we were looking at contacting you to our own dumpster for the day to come by and pick that pick up our own dumpster on the day of act on the day of loadout. And we'll have act and we'll have sanitation there on site throughout okay. the activation as well. It's not going to be like a end all throw it dump it kind of thing. We'll have sanitation on site throughout the activation. Um, Wayne, go ahead. So it, it sounds like there's about three days when the plaza won't be open to the public. Is that right? The so the plaza will not be fully shut down. It'll be still open as we're constructing. Uh, but yeah, it would we would start to load in on Thursday night due to the Veterans Day holiday on Friday. Friday would be light load in. There wouldn't be a lot of action in terms of you know in, in terms of big structures or anything moving on Friday. And then Saturday is the day of activation. <laughs> And this is strictly an advertisement for Savannah. Correct. It's a tourism activation. Correct. Uh huh. Okay. Rocio. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It gets me interested. Maybe I do <laughs> want to go to Savannah. <laughs> Come on by. But. <laughs> Sounds like it will be a fun place to visit. My question is regarding um, security and crowd control. Yeah. Will your security be armed? Uh, that's something we could look into if that's preferred. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll obviously want to oblige by what you guys require and what you guys prefer. We can have an armed security guard, or if you prefer not to have an arm, we completely comply with whatever you prefer. And, and in terms of crowd control, we, the, the tent holds about 150 people max. Um, but we're kind of looking at limiting it, you know, around that 70, 80 to 120, just because of the, the floral and the landscaping we'll have inside. So though we don't anticipate any type of line or stanchions being used just because it's open to the public and they can walk through probably five, 15 minutes and they're out. So we don't anticipate any li long standing lines. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, we, we have a question from Darlene who's um, asking who's doing the tent setup. Is uh, it a New York tent. Okay. I have another question, Will. Yeah, go ahead. Um, did you say you were going to get a, a dumpster? Well, yeah, we were looking at the most efficient ways to get kind of a dumpster to pick. In the past of our experiences, we rented a dumpster for the day, and then the sanitation company comes by and picks it up. But and if where, where would the dumpster go if you're, since there's no seat, there's very little space available around the tent? for people, for the public. Yep, so the activation space is the way it faces east, we would be, we would essentially have the generator and the dumpster in the northwest part. So it would be behind our tent and it would be away from the public area. And who are the Gansevoort Plaza folks you've been talking about? Uh, we've been just communication with Kevin uh, Tapun, Tapuno. I, I don't want to mispronounce his last the name. Packing district. What's that? Is it the meat packing district? Correct. Yeah, it's the meat, meat packing bid? The partnership there. The bid. Oh, the partnership. The bid. Yes, correct. Uh huh. Um. Okay. 
I would, I'm trying to see if I can, if there's a map of the dimensions of, uh, of the plaza that I can find. But, um, all right, does anyone else on the committee have a question? We'll, we'll open it up to others outside the committee as well. Um, Donna, go ahead. Yeah, I was trying to find the dimensions myself. So you're saying that the, the east side of the plaza, basically the area in front of Malaska is the area that will be left open? That'll be our entrance, correct. So our the rear of our tent will face the west side. Okay, and then and and then from what you just said, your generator and the dumpster will go on the northwest corner. Which North is of that, in a little inlet, yes, correct. And the and the generators and will be covered with white vinyl, so they won't be open to the public. They'll be covered and protected. Okay, so people though the the walkway when you're saying five feet, the generators will be pulled in from that. So along Ninth Avenue, you'll still have the five feet clearance after they have the big um, granite blocks there? Correct, yeah. So the, between the granite blocks and where the generators will be, it'll be about four to five feet of pedestrian walkway. Okay, and then you're shutting down Saturday at six. How, what are the hours of the breakdown of this? So we'll be completely off, off grounds by 6 a.m. on Sunday. So does that, my question really is, are, does that mean you're breaking down all through the night? Correct, yes, uh-huh. And you're permitted to do that? We've asked for an after hours, uh, after hours permit from our tent company. They, they've dropped in that and part of our quote uh, as part of an after hours loadout. Okay. And that, so they're, that, taking, they're taking care of the permitting for that for us, I believe. That, that sound is gonna carry up and out of that plaza area. Um, the, you know, there are residents across the street and, and up and out where the sound carries from. So I think it's important to be mindful of that if there's a lot of metal clanking around in the middle of the night and all of that. And then and then I guess my other question with that, does that mean Gansevoort Street will have to be closed with that breakdown and setup or no? Or Ninth Avenue? We, as of as of so far of our communication, we have not been told that the street will need to be need to be closed. And and to your point about the metal clanking, our, our intuition is to take the tent down first immediately after 6 p.m. So the big structure will be out of there way before 6 a.m. The tent structure will actually be out of there probably by 1 a.m. And then the rest will be just moving the trees and landscaping. So hopefully to your point, the metal clanking will be done by about midnight. Okay, and then the backup sounds of trucks backing up and, and back and forth and all of that kind of sound as well during the night? That would be that would be the excess, yeah, after the 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. right. Well, we would obviously work to keep it as minimal as possible though. Okay, I'd encourage you to keep as many seats open for the public. It's a holiday weekend. So, so your event sounds like people will be going through it with the big oak tree in there, but um, people also sit and eat there. Um, so I think it's important to try to keep some seats in there. Absolutely, yeah. And, and that's one of the things we've talked with Kevin about. We wanna make sure that we maximize that the public seating as much as possible. Um, thanks, um, Joanna. Uh, yeah, just curious about the sort of like weatherization of the structure and in the anticipation not that we've had a snow in November anytime recently, but whether snow, wind, rain, all of that, um, if there's any alternate plan or if it's just expected to withstand those conditions. Yep, our tent company has kind of certified for a certain amount of weight and weather, and, and it's extreme, almost like hurricane style weather. And so um, in terms of certification of the tent itself, it is very sturdy. It's a it's got three steel beams in the middle supporting it, um, as well as the ground and the anchors. They're anchored by ballast all the way around. So we don't, even though the weather might be cold, windy, and rain, we don't anticipate having any issues with the tent. And then we will have HVAC as well. So there will be some heat inside the tent as well. Won't be, there won't be any uh, cold weather inside. Thanks. And yeah, and uh, just to, to add on to, you know, what Donna was saying, I think it's not very typical for us to see breakdowns happening all throughout the night. Sure. Um, I would have a conversation again with the bid um, and just see, you know, uh, if you're ending at six, maybe you can end 30 minutes earlier um, and, you know, try to do a lot of the stuff, that, you know, as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. obviously it's a bit of a process but i mean I, I would just i would just put that out there it's it's not super common for us to see that noted um i don't know if wayne had another question yeah i have another okay. idea if, if if there's hvac what is what is powering that 
So we're going to have those a generator. I mentioned the generators will be up by the northwest side. Yeah. And we've okay. actually we're working with a movie production company who actually has the they're really super quiet generators, which is what we wanted because we're kind of going for this park atmosphere. And so we are our, we ourselves didn't want loud noise in generators. So we've really paid attention to that and have kind of splurged for some very quiet running generators. And who's sponsoring this? Is it the city of Savannah or the state of Georgia? It's Visit Savannah Tourism. So it's the tour, it's the destination marketing organization for Savannah, Georgia. Rocio? Uh, you mentioned that you were gonna have heat in, in case that it's required or needed. What type of units will you be uh, utilizing for this heat? I believe the tent company is going to use some duct, small duct work uh, to put heat in it. But they've we've talked about with them about a couple different options on how we can how we can heat the tent. Um, but once we confirm that, uh, we can actually absolutely send the plans for that. So you don't know at this time. Well, it'll be through it'll be through small duct work. So it's going to connect from the HVAC unit from the generator into this into the tent. There'll be four basically there'll be four duct works that it'll be they won't be visible to the audience, the consumer. There'll be four essentially duct work in each corner that will distribute the heat equally throughout the tent. So it won't be one big giant duct work. It'll be four smaller duct works. Duct duct okay. work. I can't say that word. Thank you. You're welcome. Brian. Hi, thank Hi. you, uh, Sean. I was wondering um, if you're going to be uh, dis um, erecting this tent and having this display at other locations in New York City? Nope, Ganza Wart Plaza is our primary choice, our only choice. <laughs> and why did you choose Ganza Wart Plaza? Well, actually, the, the title of the activation was originally called Expect the Unexpected, and it turned morphed into Surprisingly Savannah. And so with that, we wanted to kind of take this motion, this idea of taking this calm, serene park of Savannah, Georgia, and drop it in the middle of New York City where people wouldn't expect it. And so with that, we thought the district and the area around it with all the brands and the artwork and the culture, it really fit what we were going for. And then on top of it, lastly, the Visit Savannah Tourism team really wanted to kind of penetrate and target Target local New Yorkers because that's who wants to come down to Savannah for a weekend or a girls trip, a bachelor party. So that was kind of their core audience. And we really, after talking with the Gansevoort team, the demographics of, of the area just really fit our target audience. Thank you. You're welcome. Rocio, do you have another question? Yes, I do. Um, so what other cities have you uh, done this at None. This is, this is the first time that Savannah's ever done a brand activation. My agency, on the other hand, we've done we've done several. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Do we have any any other questions from the committee or public? Okay. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for your time. We I really appreciate you joining and sticking around. Um, thanks for the time. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. You too. Okay. Uh, moving on. The next agenda item is November twelfth, the Timberland Mobile Pop Up. Do we have anyone here from the Timberland Mobile Pop Up? This was also one I, where we didn't get a response. Yes, Pete. Pete, go ahead. Go ahead. We can't hear you. Um, all right, I don't know if you're on mute, Pete. Um, we can come back to you, but we're not hearing you. Um, so while he, while he gets that sorted, let's go. Let's go to the next one. Um, do we have anyone here from the Dance for Kindness? I don't see any hands raised. Riley Mason was the person on there. Anybody here from the Dance for Kindness? Um, from Life or from Life Vest Inside is the organization. No. Okay. 
And then I think we should have someone here for our last street activity, the IDE public restroom pop up. Um, all right, let's, all right, let me have Pete first and then we will go to Natalie, if that's okay. Pete, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? Now we can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm confused by this uh, Timberland application. I'm looking at the paperwork. Yeah. It says they want to close Mercer from Broome to Howard. That's two blocks. Broome to Grand, Grand to Howard. Uh, the store, they don't specify where. Uh, they say um, a mobile trailer unit will be parked in the plaza. There's no plaza on Mercer Street. So what are they doing? Um, it, it's just very confusing. And the fact that they're not here uh, is really problematic because yeah. this means you guys will say no, but SAPO's going to do what SAPO's going to do. But it's yeah, so, totally unclear what they're even asking for. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, well, I think we can do like we did last time. I mean, we, we have the automatic no show deny. We can add that extra commentary in there. Uh, in any case, they should absolutely, to the to the to the extent that so Sapo decides to approve it, they have to pick one block. They're not letting you can't do two blocks for a new street closure. So at the very least, they need to pick one block. But yeah, I agree. I, I don't know um, what the plaza is referring to. So. Let us include some of that commentary in there. Great, thank you. Um, I also have a question about the IDE, the uh, the restroom, public restroom pop up. They're not so, here, right? No, they're here. So let's let's hear a presentation oh, from okay. them, and then we can come back if you have any questions. I think Natalie is here representing them. Is is that right, Natalie? Or are you here for something else? Go ahead. Thanks for ID. Hi, thanks for joining. Go, please go ahead and. Uh, and present. Thank you. Yeah, so so we work with the agency, uh, the experiential group. We're an experiential agency based in New York City. We were hired by um, the company IDE. It's a nonprofit organization um, because they wanted to do a streetwide activation um, taking place on National Toilet Day on 1119. So what they're trying to do is drive awareness to their cause and kind of play along with the National Toilet Day. So what they're going to do is they're going to offer a public restroom. Um, we're thinking they, the thought is Soho because obviously there's a lot of foot traffic and, and visuals, but um, IDE is a nonprofit organization that wants to, you know, drive awareness to get more, um, you know, more sanitary stations available to uh, poverty communities and less fortunate communities. So they thought that this was like a, you know, a fun, creative way to kind of drive the awareness to their cause. Can you, thanks, Nala. Can you, can you go into a little more detail about IDE? I don't know if I'm familiar with them. Yeah. So IDE, um, really like I definitely, I would in, in, encourage all of you guys to check them out. It's IDE Global. Dot org. And so what they do is they power entrepreneurs to end poverty. Um, they've been around for a while, but what they do is, you know, they believe that everyone has the ability to increase livelihoods and build, you know, long term resilience to their own accord. So they want, you know, underprivileged communities, they want them to build schools, build infrastructures, but, you know, um, they really want to drive awareness in communities and they want people to kind of jump on board. Um, I'll pull up. Okay. So it's a, it's a larger, it's, it's a large organization. It's got multi-million dollar budget. Oh yeah. They absolutely. Work throughout it's developing global. Countries. Yeah. It's global worldwide. Um, okay. yeah. Um, so this is just one of their many things. So like yeah. the thought is that, um, you know, there's not, there's not a ton of sanitary stations in these lower developed communities. And so, you know, there's no access to running water. There's not access to clean um, showers, bathrooms, stuff like that. So um, they'll definitely, they'll be, you know, they're looking for people to sort of like join, sign up, uh, be part of the organization to help build these, build, you know, build bathrooms that are public and that are energy powered, green, eco-friendly, all of that. 
Yeah. Okay. So you're, can you, can you go a little more in detail into what the activation looks like? It's basically, what is yeah. it? It's a, it's a, it's a portable toilet trailer. Yeah. yeah do you have any, just, do you we're going to see if we can, we're trying to figure out how to share the screen. Here, let me, um, I think, um, do you let have to give us the ability to do it? Because I actually don't see it. Let me let me promote you to a panelist. If you hit it, hit yes, you should rejoin as a panelist. Um, and then let me see if I can. Okay, I just changed it to so host and panelists can share a screen. So you should be able to. Let me know if it doesn't work, Natalie. Uh, I know. Well, so what we're doing is we're just renting like no. a ten stall it, trailer, bathroom trailer. It doesn't it? It didn't let you share it. Um, trying to. We're trying to get there. I just changed the the sharing options. You can also send it to me, um, just William Benish at gmail .com if it doesn't work for you. And then I can share it. I don't know why it wouldn't work though. I think it's like our systems preference system. Okay. You want to just email it uh, to me? It's just my name at Gmail and I, and you can keep talking then and I'll share it. Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, what we're about to send. So it's just basically a 10 stall bathroom trailer. You know, it's like your standard bathroom trailer you'd see at a, an outdoor festival. Um, that's like all over. It's in Dumbo, stuff like that. So it's a 10 stall bathroom trailer. Uh, it will be branded. So it'll be fully branded with, um, you know, their talking points, their, their, their basic logo. Um, and it's going to be really what we'll do is like, we're going to pull up on the curb. The stairs will just be right on the sidewalk, but the actual trailer will be pulled up on like the, on the street lane. Obviously that's why we need a curb lane permit. Um, and so It'll be a trailer, completely vinyled. We'll have security. We'll have staff that will help with like, you know, line management flow. It'll be your standard brand ambassadors, greeting guests, explaining what's going on. There'll be a QR code so people can scan the phones and um, kind of get an understanding of the overall, you know, purpose of this and the, the drive for awareness. Um, and then people will be able to like walk into this really cute branded out um, bathroom trailer they'll obviously be able to use it um, it's open to the public so the activation hours themselves will be 10 a.m to 6 p.m um, we'll obviously monitor it we'll make sure it's clean and tidy we'll have attendants tending it um, you know there'll be a water system hookup it's you know going to be a little bit chilly so we'll make sure that it's nice and heated um, and that's really it it's it's really very straightforward it's basically just like putting a, a public bathroom outside. Um, and it's it's right on Broadway between Prince and Spring Street. So there really shouldn't be, you know, any sort of reasoning as to any of like the businesses nearby having an issue with it. And, and now which side, which side of Broadway is it going to be on? Um, which side of Broadway is it going to be on? That's a great question. Let me just pull up the locations deck. This is the West. It's the West Curb location deck right there. Were you able to get our presentation? Yeah. What's the email you would like it sent to? It's his name. If you see my name, William.Benish at Gmail. I think that will be very helpful. Thank you. While, while you're sending that, um, let me go to questions, um, Rocio. So I have questions regarding IDE. First of all, where are they located? Um, are there to be honest, we don't work for IDE. We were just hired by one of their agencies. So I would definitely encourage you guys to take a look of their website. Um, they're, they're based globally. So I know they have got headquarters all through the United States. They've got headquarters in Europe. They've got headquarters pretty much everywhere. Um, so it's not just, they don't have like, headquarters just in New York. They're actually not New York based. They're not New York based. Nope. Nope. They did okay. a lot of research and they kind of zoned in on doing New York City for their activation. I think they originally wanted to do this in Times Square, um, but you know, they're a nonprofit organization. The, the Their dollars can only get them so far. Um, and so Times Square was obviously completely out of budget. And so we helped them kind of land on a location, which was Soho, which 
you know, still drives an amazing amount of foot traffic. However, we thought Soho would make more sense versus Times Square, where you kind of have, you know, tourists, people coming and going, you know, they're, they're a bit focused on their, you know, their travel and their vacation, what have you. So we thought Soho would be probably a better, you know, um, community visuals for them to really like be able to drive their point across. You've got, it's a Saturday. They actually were aiming a weekday, but National Toilet Day landed on a weekend date. Um, but, you know, they, they want people that are actually going to pay attention. They really want to, you know, drive the point home that they're, they're out here for a good cause. Um, and it's just a cute, fun way to do it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I just reading about it on Wikipedia, it says in 2015, they had a $25 million budget and they're located in a bunch of different countries. So it seems it's a very large global organization. It says they're headquartered in Denver. So I don't know if that's still the case. Yep, that makes sense. Um, so I have a, can everybody see this? I have the dimensions up here. This is a very detailed presentation. Um, it looks like it's 25 feet. Um, yeah, so it's actually going to be 25 feet long. It'll get dropped. It'll get pulled in with like a an actual, you know, a uh, uh, pickup truck, and then it will leave. So it's about 25 feet long. Plus, we're thinking about 30, you know, because you've got the the hitch. And then it's when it's closed, it's eight feet wide. But it's about overall with like the stairs. Once we like put the you know the steps, um, it'll be just about 12 feet wide. And do you know where kind of along that block it's gonna be parked? I know it's on the west side, but I mean, closer to Prince in the middle. Natalie's in the spring. Yeah, so it's actually, so like, it'll be right by, do you see where like the Lacoste store is on the map? Yep. Right around there is the thought. All right, so clo a bit closer to spring. Yep, yep, closer towards spring. Uh, sorry, go go ahead, Susan. And then and then we're you know obviously it's going to open up onto the sidewalk. Of course, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be opening up into the street. It would be opening up into the sidewalk. Okay. Um, uh, looking at these diagrams, it doesn't appear that any of these bathrooms will be ADA accessible. Am I correct, or will you have something that is accessible? Yeah, unfortunately, it's not ADA compliant. They, you know, we obviously gave them that option um, and they, you know, they took it and they made the decision to just go with the 10, the 10 stall trailer. They just, again, budget super tight on this one. And so they're just hoping that they're able to more so drive the point. Sorry, that's actually they that's were something else. Yeah, they that's, were about <laughs> that's a big deal, though. I mean, in the sense that we're talking about accessibility for people who don't have things. And I think that missing that, especially in if you're presenting it here, um, it may strike people as something as somewhat elitist, frankly, that you're not including that. Sure. Just to um, be considered. Yeah, absolutely. It was for sure consideration. Um, you know, it got it got presented, and I think, you know, the dollars didn't add up. They weren't able to afford it. We can definitely bring it back up to them. Um, it's an absolutely great point. Um, I think the thought is the brand is probably going to have a think on like, you know, in case someone does want to participate and isn't able to, how they're going to go about it or what the talking points along with it will be. Um, and then, you know what, we also have, do you want to send him an email um, that has like the actual graphics? Because we can show you. Oh, okay. You also have an email from Natalie that, that shares the graphics of what we're thinking the exterior will look like. And I saw another question about unisex. Um, so yeah, they're going to, they're going to be labeled as unisex bathrooms. So you can go on either side. Um, unfortunately, we're limited to what these you know, what these bathroom trailers, the way that they're built, one side will have urinals and one side won't. There's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is interesting. I mean, one of the things that people have brought up at various times in the last couple of years is that New York City compared to some other cities has a lack of public toilets. Mm -hmm. Is this, I'm trying to see, I mean, is this branding, is it going to touch on that or is it more on lack no, of toilets no, it's, it's in not Walmart, really, like in, in developing countries yeah it's more about developing countries it's not a knock on new york city um at all and actually we were super considerate of location because of that we didn't want it to be like um 
we didn't want it to be like competing with any parks and have like, you know, we didn't want it to be like near a Starbucks where people are constantly trying to use the bathrooms. Like we didn't want it to be a New York City nod at all. Um, this is meant to be for, you know, non underprivileged communities. Um, and then I saw a question pop up about hand washing stations. Yep, this is a, a fully equipped like luxury bathroom trailer. So they'll be fully working hand washing stations. Oh, Adam, sorry, I saw that you were responding <laughs> too quick. Um, okay, let me just stop sharing again. Um, I mean, is there, a, I'm not 100% sure whether there is, but I mean, did you, is there a special permit? I'm just curious. I don't know if I've, if we've looked at something like this before for like a portable restroom, like how, did you have to mention it to sanitation or anything, or you can just go and rent these trailers basically? Yeah, not that, yeah, there's not. There's not yeah. any sort okay. of permit, um, but we obviously we're making sure that like you know just to make sure that everybody's in a in a good place. We're we're hiring security. We're hiring a team just to sanitize it. So we're gonna have it internally that you know every ten uses or something a team's gonna they're there all day long. So they're gonna go in. They'll replenish it. Um, it's hard to say honestly if people are even going to use this maybe they will um, it's more just to get the you know get the word and get the name out there um, but yeah we'll have a team we'll have someone dedicated to each bathroom each, each side um, and Adam uh, sorry I know I, I promoted you Adam I'm sorry you've been answering in chat um, but yeah. you can answer uh, you can answer in person as well um, I thought I promoted you yeah um, Rocio, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I keep hearing you say that the budget, the budget and the money, isn't this a multi-million dollar uh, company that is globe-wide? So what are we talking about? Uh, I don't understand why uh, this cannot be ADA accessible. It just doesn't make sense to me at all. Uh, you're spending this money to put this out, but you forgot about the people that are the most needy, the ones that need these restrooms. Can yeah, I think, that? That, um, I think for them, it's it's not really our decision as the production agency. We can only explain what we can and, you know, put, put numbers in front of them. Um, from an ADA complaint, I think that, you know, it's something that we promoted to them. I think that they'll they'll marinate on it and we'll see how they respond to it. We can let them know everybody's feedback. And do you think you'll have enough time to do that? Because it's, this is November, it's not? Yeah, it's just renting a- it's November just, 19th, yeah. yeah. Um, Adam, I saw you were typing a lot of stuff. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, okay. Yeah, my client's doing a good job of explaining what everything is, but, you know, we would just like to push that, that you know, this is a, a nice nonprofit to try to bring awareness, you know, it's not a corporate brand looking to advertise themselves and, you know, it, it's definitely a good cause and a global cause to bring awareness, so um, we would just like to point that out. Okay. And then just to your, your question about like, you know, money and I personally don't ever like research that I don't dive that much into like our brands and where their dollars go to. But my guess um, would be that a non -off, a nonprofit organization like this, their money goes to building infrastructure, infrastructure, their money goes to, you know, paying employees, their money goes to being able to expand and, and build communities out of their pocket, um, help build build things like bathroom stations out of their pocket. That would be my guess. I, I don't imagine that they allocate a huge amount of their money towards marketing events and marketing things. I know that this is like one of the only things that they're doing in terms of like promotion to get the word out there. That's why we really want to make sure that they're in a location that, you know, they care about and that they, you know, they feel good about. So I, I would just say that I don't think it's um, them being like, we're, we're picking what we want to spend our money on. I think they're like, what makes sense? And, um, but I hear you. I, I definitely will put the, the ADA compliant back on their radar for sure. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, any other questions from the committee or CB2? We have a couple questions from the public. Um, 
Okay, let me let me go back to you, Pete. Great, thank you. Um, I live on this block, and I live opposite where I live on the east side. So I live opposite where the this is planned to be placed in front of Lacoste, which is 543 Broadway, 541 Broadway, excuse me, is not a good place. There's a fire hydrant right nearby that is a very active storefront. Up the block at 550, 549 to 557 are two empty storefronts. Um, I'm not saying that this should be approved, but that location would be a much less problematic location than the one that was described. Uh, you think this that's organization is a very, I, I did a little research, it's a very worthy organization that does work around the world, not so much in the United States, it seems, uh, but they do worthy work. Um, I'm surprised that the way they're advertising it is by putting up a, the big word potty on the stuff. I think it maybe that works for the way they want to brand themselves. But um, my main concern is where you would park this thing. And I don't really want it across the street from me because I know it's got a generator on top and I will hear that all day long. But if you're gonna bring it onto the block, it really needs to go in front of the empty storefronts and not in front of an active storefront where there are a lot of people already. Thank you very much. Not only is that, yeah. We is not block the hydrant. We, we would definitely be 10 to 15 feet to the east or west of any hydrant. We would never block a hydrant. To the north, yeah, to the north or south, I mean. Um, 549 okay, to 557 Broadway is where you should be looking, please. That's great. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, to, to Adam's point, we would definitely be nowhere near blocking. We'd stay at least 10 to 15 feet back away from the hydrant. Um, but that's really helpful. We, are, we would definitely be closer to where your, recommenda your recommendation is. Okay. Um, Jeffrey, did you have a question? I just would like to iterate that the New York City law is not 10 to 15 feet from the hydrant. It is 15 feet from the hydrant. And I agree with Pete, it's a very poor placement to put it in front of an active store than a store that is not active. So it should be further up the block. It's a very bad placement uh, choice that you've made. And I'm very concerned about fire hydrant access 15 feet is even sometimes not really sufficient in a crowded area where trucks pull over and there's obstructions. So I would advise you to move it further north uh, above that where it is. Uh, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Was there any particular reason, um, Natalie, why you chose that exact spot or is it flexible? It's really flexible. It's mostly that street. It's just, um, you know, in terms of knowing the foot traffic, it has nothing to do with any of the store front fronts whatsoever. Um, we are happy to shift it back. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I think uh, I don't see any other questions. So uh, thanks, thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Adam, for joining. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, I think before, you know, our last agenda item before, before we move into business session um, is we will open the floor um, for anyone from the public who wants to, um, and let me just lower your hand, Pete, for now so I can catch um, anyone raising their hand but we are gonna open the floor for anyone who wants to comment on um, what they would like to see, uh, if they'd like to see us add or change anything in sort of our portion of the district needs statement or budget priorities. 
Um, you know, these are these are what we do every year. They're posted online on the CB website. Um, and I know that by rule, we want to give everyone from the public, um, you know, a chance to comment on that. So if you're from the public and you want, yes, Rocio. Just have a question. Um, I'm sorry if I missed it. Uh, what about the last one, the block party for independent school K-8 Halloween party? What did you say about that? Did I miss it? That That's an FYI renewal. Okay, I believe. thank you. Right? Yeah. I don't see the how I, I don't see that one, Rocio. Yeah, that's the last one. Where are you seeing that? 111 Washington Place. That's for November 11. So I guess we're not listening, we're not hearing that one, right? That's the Fall Fest, the South Village Farmers Market, and the Thanksgiving Day. I'm looking right now on the CB2 website. Those are all FYI renewals. Is, are you looking at the Fall Fest on Washington between Sixth and Barrow? Yes. Those are all FYI renewals, so they're not they're not presenting. Do you know anything about that Thanksgiving Day dinner? I'm not, very, I'm not familiar with it. Does anybody let's, know? Anything? Let's let's go. They're not presenting, so we can talk when we go into business session. We can talk about that, Rocio. Okay, thank we you. We always talk about the resolutions for each of those, including the FYI renewals. Um, so, so Susan, can I actually ask you a quick question? Um, for for the for the discussion of district needs and um, and budget priorities, I mean, it, do we typically have a public session for any input, and then we would just go into business session to discuss our views, or should we do that during public session? Um, you know. Uh, well, there really is, this is usually something, um, while we invite, um, I mean, certainly the public is invited to to contribute. It's really something yes. more that we, uh, as a committee, will discuss in terms of, because of, you know, just trying to figure out priorities and what is most likely to be actually acted upon. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So I thought we would have public session and see if there's any comments. I don't see any, and then we can talk about it once we go into business session. Is that okay? Yeah, usually we we don't get a lot of input from the public on this. You know, these yeah. kinds of things, you, you're looking at things that will show up year after year until they hopefully get acted on. So that's what the list may not change very much from year to year. Yeah, okay. Um. So let's let's go to let's leave that to the end. Let's just go back through business session now and, and kind of in order. Um, so anyone have any thoughts on our on part one? I thought it was a useful presentation uh, from Patrick. Hopefully people gain some knowledge there. Um, I think we should just set a you know have a reminder for ourselves to check back kind of at, in December or in January of 23. Um, because I, I do feel like there will be some certain kind of uh, select projects where we should be talking to our electeds um, and seeing if we can get some funding there. I mean, it's a lot of money, 4.2 billion. Well, is there um, anything we want to do to encourage people to vote for the proposition? Mm. We're assuming that it will be adopted. We don't know that. Yeah, I mean. And it's important to make people aware that it's aware, going to right. be yeah, I mean, people ignore those things. I, I wanted this just to be pretty edu you know, educational um, and get people aware of it. Um, I wanted to be sort of as neutral as possible. I couldn't really find any organizations that had come out against it. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I clearly personally think this is a good thing. And I think you know, we've done our job by educating people. Um, I am personally surprised that uh, I feel um, the state hasn't been out there all that much really promoting this, and there's not a lot of public knowledge about it, in my opinion. Um, perhaps, you, perhaps you can mention it in your report to the board. Yeah, I, I don't think we need a resolution, you. but yeah, we can have, a, I would love to put a summary of it just in my report. Good, good. Um, yes, Joanna. Yeah, I would just add, um, I, I do think um, the coalition that's been focused on this has mostly prioritized upstate central New York um, and places that they think would be harder pushes um, in terms of support for the Bond Act. So there's been a lot of like 
distribution of yard signs, things like that, that haven't exactly fallen in the um, New York audience. I think New York State or New York City is not publicly advocating for it because there is no set amount right now for mm -hmm. New York or that's not in the so I don't think there will be something coming out from the city anytime soon, but it is good to at least direct people to like the social media sites. And I think the website is a pretty helpful tool and has some good graphics. Great. That's an interesting point because it, it not only would it be a harder sell upstate if they perceive it as something that's designed for downstate, for you know the low lying areas of, of New York and Long Island, they might vote mm -hmm. against it. You know, mm -hmm. upstate downstate kind of division. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, Joanna, I, I I probably should have done this before, but do you want to just take thirty seconds to introduce yourself to everybody on here? I know I introduced you in the email, but I I, I sh I'm sorry I should have done this at the start of the meeting. But would you want to just give thirty seconds of your background just so everybody? Uh, can get to know you a little bit. Sure. Yeah. And um, happy to. So I currently work for Rebuild by Design, which is in CB2, but really also generally focus my work around New York City on resilience and climate adaptation in particular. Um, so I have been connected to the Bond Act in terms of having worked on the research that initially initially um, originated behind the strategy for the Bond Act, um, and then stay up to date on the, that as well, as well as some of the other issues that I know CB2 is focused on, like the HAT study. So um, kind of have my ear in several other, several issues relating to resilience and flood adapt adaptation in New York, but also have born and raised in New York and care about the city. So that's me. Thanks. Thanks, Joanna. And, and yeah, the HAT study will be, um a big topic for next month, I think, as we're all aware. Great. Should we move on to um, talking about the street activities? So let's go to um, let's go to the first one. The first one was a no show um, Financial Times phone booth. Um, so I sent out, you know, we sent out, had the office send out three emails, by the way, to everybody. So, uh, you know, there's, I don't think people can say they weren't aware that they're supposed to show up. So that's a no show. Um, you know, uh, that would be a deny. Is anyone else opposed to that? No. Okay. Unanimous deny. Um, and uh, let's go on to the second one. Um, uh, the Moxie Hotel. Okay, I think I think we can just sort of take that, or we can just pass a resolution. I don't even think we need a resolution. I think we just remove that one because it's not um, not relevant to our district. So we can just make a note of that. Unless anyone thinks we should do a resolution saying, you know, we heard them and. and they shifted the location so it no longer touches CP2. We shouldn't be commenting on things outside yeah. of the district. That's, yeah. you know, uh, but we sh they should, you know, the, the right district should be made aware that that's where they. Yeah. Yeah. I think what happens on these is it, this, the automated um, system from SAPO will send it to whatever district it's touching. And if it's kind of on the border, like this was because Bowery runs between two and three. I think I'm sure we both got notifications. Um, I, I don't know what their process is for street activities. I don't think anyone's reviewing them as robustly as we are, but we also probably have more street activities than almost any other district. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they would have gotten the notification of it from SAPO. Um, okay. Um, so the visit Savannah, what do people think about that one? So there were a lot of questions here. I took a bunch of notes. Um, Michael? I have a concern about the amount of space that will be left in the plaza. If there's only five feet surrounding the structure and there is still going to be room, will there be room for benches and for um, 
umbrellas. I wasn't clear on the answer, how well they're working that out. So I think in our resolution, we should say something to the effect of, we have a concern that as much of the plaza as possible be left open for normal pedestrian traffic and use of the plaza. Yeah, I, I, I don't see how in five feet you can fit the table, you know, a table with three chairs around it and a big umbrella. And the generator they're talking about. Yeah, I I was looking for a map with actual schematics of Gansworth Plaza. I think that'd be useful. I we might have had one just like on previous applications, but I can't find one right away. So I think but, I mean, sixty by mention. sixty. That's pretty. It's pretty big. Right. I think we need to mention it in our resolution. We're concerned yeah. about the amount of space that will be left in the plaza for typical plaza uses. Uh, Brian? Yeah, okay. So I was thinking about our matrix or what we started out as a matrix and ended up with simply a list of things that we want to talk about. So I'm thinking about what's on the list. And number one, there's no real connection to the city or the community or the neighborhood. Uh, number two, I mean, unless you think a tourism attraction is, is something, um, it, uh, it's for the length of time and this overnight breakdown period is very concerning to me. Uh, so there's uh, there seems to be an abundant length of time that it's going to be occupying the plaza. And then um, doesn't it's everything is free, uh, they said, but um, you know, does it? Well, anyway, that's it's just a couple of uh, big uh, red flags, you might say, or things that would say, you know, this really doesn't belong here. But uh, that's that's giving me some misgivings. Although, it, on the other hand, uh, I, I don't find anything terribly objectionable about what they're presenting. So that's my. Yeah. Um... I, I tend to agree the concept of sort of advertising a whole different city within our city, it's kind of a, a strange concept to me. Um, Wayne? Yeah, I, I think it's just a big advertisement for Savannah and it doesn't bring anything culturally or educationally to um, the plaza or to the neighborhood. Um, I really can't see how it would support any tables or chairs with five feet of space. That sounds very small. And the noise that's going to be going on overnight is going to be intrusive to the neighbors. And the generator, even though he says they're going to try for a clean, uh, quiet generator, I'm not really sure what that is, but it, generators normally make noise. So yeah. I would be not supportive of this. Yeah, and the fact that it's essentially closing off the plaza during a holiday, I think is a little concerning. The timing is is, is an issue too. I mean, there are ads on TV all the time, you know, go, for tourism, you know, all over the place for, for in different states as well as upstate, you know, in New York, but it's kind of strange to have this, in, 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 you know, in person sort of thing, but it, what you're, but Wayne is right. What does it contribute for us or for any of the local businesses or things around us? Rocio? Well, I think that in everything, there's some part of education. And I think there is something that you can learn from it. It does give you education about Savannah, uh, the food and the music and, but I think this event should really take place in the middle of Central Park. <laughs> that, would be, that would be something different, but uh, you don't expect a park within a park, right? But I don't know, I, 
I think that the overnight um, taking down and building, I think is gonna be disruptive to the neighbors. So I, I, in one way I wanna support it, but I think it's the wrong place for it. Yeah. I, uh, what I would say is I would tend not to support it. I do know, we do know in the past that sometimes often they still get approved. Um, so I think we should have language in there, um, you know, saying if the event goes forward, we need to maximize seating and whatever possible. Um, and some of the other commentary, I think that everyone already made. Um, would people be supportive of a resolution structured like that? So deny with yet with suggestions. Okay. okay. Would anyone be opposed to that? Please tell me. Okay. Uh, any recusals or abstentions? Okay. So we'll put we'll put unanimous deny with suggestions. Um, for the Timberland, that was a no show. Um, I'm good putting some of those uh, additional comments I think that Pete made uh, and and just stuff about notifying SAFO that it's two blocks and the rules generally just one block for new festivals. Um, is any, ever, anyone opposed to that approach? Okay. Uh, um, Dance for Kindness was also a no-show. Um, so uh, anyone opposed to denial for that no-show? No. Okay, and then um, IDE. Um, I, I think I'm you know, general, generally okay with this, with the added commentary about the specific location that we got at the end. Um, the ADA thing is an issue. It is still supporting a nonprofit that I think does, does do good work from what I'm seeing looking online. Um, so I don't know, I would, uh, my view would be to support it with the strong view that they really look hard into the ADA uh, compliant trailer. Uh, and with the commentary that they, they, and it seemed like they said they would, move it to 549 to 557. But does anyone else have some comments here? I know the ADA thing is a bit disappointing. Yeah, I strongly agree with you, Will. So that yeah. sounds I mean, it, it does in a way undermine their message. They're talking about bringing something essential to people without it. And here we are talking about members of our own community who are being deprived of access. And I understand, but I understand, you know, they're a nonprofit and it is a worthy message, but when they calculate, you know, they make these plans, that has to be calculated in because that's the very way that people who are dependent upon accessibility get left out. So it is, it, it's like just the money argument really doesn't cut it enough but I ultimately would support it. Thank you, Susan. Um, Rocio? Yeah, when we think about, uh, are they local? They're not. Um, it, it may be a very worthy cause, but they're not local. And the fact that ADA compliance is not there, I'm kind of torn about it um, because and I also felt that the young lady who who um, presented, I don't think, was well prepared to answer many of the questions. So um, I'm kind of torn both ways. I'm, I'm not sure um, if this is the right place for this. And there was really no reason that she gave um, that I can recall why this particular place. I think just because it's a high, probably just because it's a high traffic. Location. So it's uh, like, you know, Times Square, like she said, it was Times Square, but it's too private. It's too expensive. So, okay. So there could be other places. 
not necessarily in, in, in our district, but I'm, I'm torn on this one. The ADA <clears throat> really bothers me a lot. And I don't feel that, uh, I don't know if they can make all the changes by the time that their fair go, that their project goes up. So that's all. My, my, in my view, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good point. I think compared to a lot of the commercial events that we've seen in Soho, this to me is still a more worthy cause despite the shortcoming. Um, so what I would like to do is express that through a resolution and say, you know, we know this is a nonprofit. We know they're doing good work. Um, we, we do strongly feel that this ADA thing is really important, but we wouldn't want to fully deny, you know, this organization. Uh, that's at least my personal view is how the resolution should be. Uh, is there anyone uh, is there anyone else who would not support a resolution like that? I know Rocio, you're thinking about it. Yeah, I think I'm going to abstain from because it really bothers me that uh, I, I would abstain from this one. Um, okay, how's 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 everybody else on that? Does anyone else want to vote against this or abstain, or are people okay with that framework? I think we're most effective if we support it, but really make it clear where the shortcomings are, because it's an op opportunity to set a standard for future, you know, applicants. And it's like we care about these things, and we're going to point them out to you. I would agree to that. That's good. Okay. Um, okay. So we have. Uh, I'll, I'll obviously I'll send a draft to everybody, but I'll I'll work that messaging into um, the resolution. And so I'll put um, Brian, Michael, Susan, Wayne, Joanna. Yes, Rocio abstain. Is that well, right? If you put in the resolution about the ADA, and uh, if we could have further conversation that they're actually going to comply, I would be in favor of it also. So it, it, it's a hard one, but you know what? I'll. I'll be in favor of it. I'll vote in favor of it, provided that those stipulations are there and hopefully they comply. And if they don't, when they come back next year, we know what to do with them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. You can add my name, please. Okay. Um, okay, is anyone else? Uh, I think we're, I think we're, we're good. Um, so let's move on to um, the budget priorities discussion. Um, so I, I sent around some suggestions I had um, a couple of days ago. Did everyone get those? Would it be helpful if I shared my screen? Yes, okay, give me a second here. Um, can you tell us a date when you sent it so I can uh, search? Sure. For it um, yes, it was. Give me a second. Uh, sorry. I'm going to my own email now. Um, where did I put it? Okay. Uh, October 6th, Thursday, October 6th. Um, it was titled CB2 QOL meeting 10, 11, 12 preparation. October 7th. October 6th. October 6th. Oh, somebody somebody wrote something October 7th. Okay, thank you. I got it. 5.51 p.m. Um, yes, 5, 5.51 p.m. So those are the later responses to it that made it the 7th. Yes, that's, I understand. That's right. Um, okay, so let me open this. Just give me one moment here. I know it's getting late, so thanks for everyone for staying on. Um, okay. Um,
Okay. Can everyone see this? Um, so there, I, I, I pulled out from the district need statement everywhere that I think intersects with what our committee is defined as covering. Um, so street activities, sanitation, environment, um, essentially. And so I went through and there were just a few things that I thought were worth updating. Um, the first one is in the, this just goes in order of how the district needs statement is, is met, is, uh, is written. The first one, I did think it was relevant to comment on the US Army Corps study, which has now come out. Um, um, and to talk about the fact that, you know, this is an extremely broad study. Um, and, you know, it's, th that's a useful thing, but it doesn't give a lot of detail you know, it, it doesn't help us deal with the issue um, of sort of these overlapping jurisdictions along the west side. Um, and so we've talked in the past about, you know, calling for a more comprehensive kind of localized study of resiliency along the west side. In my view, we need to get a sort of a more granular view um, and bring in all the agencies, which I don't think have really ever had a single conversation together on this. Um, so for me, I think this is something that's really important. Um, I think I think Carter's commented on this before as well. I don't know if he wants to add anything, um, but I, 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 to me, I think this is something that absolutely needs to be done. These large studies aren't aren't really going to tell us what it looks like on the ground level, um, and there's all these overlapping agencies um that look at this so i would like to sort of get more information uh, even basic stuff about you know the location of key sort of conduit lines for con ed which i've been told in the past for instance run underneath parts of that median between uh between the lanes on west street um and you know when people have talked about doing some sort of resiliency there that issues come up um so in my view, we just need more information. Uh, but I, I, Carter's talked about this before, so I, I'd like to hear from him as well. Yeah, I, I was just going to say. I mean, we we can't talk about anything really without that information, because key there there may be key infrastructure things that can't be changed or worked around, and without knowing that, you just can't have a, a decent discussion. And I'm. It's, it's very uh, unique uh, in that the state owns that land. It's, it's the, so the, I think that parts of the Hudson River Park are state owned, but they're jointly run by the city and state. And then we have the highway, which is state owned and not city owned, which is why I don't think there's a lot of discussion on these issues, but just having a, a study of the area is really key to moving forward. I mean, that's, it's pretty straightforward. I agree. Yeah, 100%, yeah. yeah, the issue is where do we get the money and who do we petition for the money? Um, and speaking to some of the elected office, offices in the past, that could come through some of these bond acts, you know, that I, I'm not sure, you know, how it's positioned in that. But what we need is, um, a, we actually, what we need is a resolution, not just a request, so that we can send that to the elected. So there's a basis for them with which to ask for that study as well. Um, yeah, I think what I'd like to do is um, right now I've asked the Army Corps to come present to us next month. Um, and I do think we should have a resolution on that, um, which I think we can see how they, you know, what they say. But I think part of that could read, uh, could essentially touch on the fact that, you know, there's been this massive study uh, which started after Sandy, and obviously we need a regional view, um, but we don't feel it's sufficient in terms of the understanding of the situation on the west side and further study needs to be taken. So I think, I think hearing the Army Corps and then having sort of a comprehensive resolution after that, we could incorporate this. Yeah, the, the, the issue for the budget request, that's going to the city, and it's not city land that this is that we're asking for the study underneath. So the city will just turn around and tell us that, that they're not the appropriate party to ask because yeah. we're asking for a study under the state um, 
under you know nine west west street what you know different areas different names um i guess it's all nine, nine yeah. west street but it, it's state so it's not really a budget request to the city all the budget requests are to the city so that's that's therein lies the issue yeah. right there is it, yeah but I think it's also a narrative and I, I, I like just have, I, I understand it's not where the money is probably going to come from, but I think it is part of the narrative, which I would like to develop here. Yeah, it's, it's part of the narrative, but the way it, we have X amount of requests to put in and what happens is that the city turns around and then says, that's not. Um, yeah, not you're talking about the budget request portion. Yeah, right, right. Not this, not this part, but yes, that's a, that's a good point. Um, okay. Um, yeah. And, so, and just, and yeah. just so you know, they, the priorities is organizing of the budget requests. I think what you're talking about is, is more of the narrative of the board, but the, the, the priorities is the ordering of the budget. Requests. Right. So. Well, we have that, we have that district need statement, which is what I'm in right now, which is right. the narrative. And then there's the, the priorities and budget requests, which is, which I have a separate document for, which I was going to go over after. Um, but so this would say you're in the district need statement, but not these, the these, budget, these are, not yeah, I, I sent out two documents to the right. committee, um, which are my suggestions for both the district need statement and the budget request. So I was just going through the district need statement quickly. And then I was going to go on to the budget requests. You know, I think it's appropriate for the district needs statement, but Carter is right. It's yeah. not correct to a budget request. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, here we, I don't know. I, some of it's kind of just splitting hairs, but we, we, I thought that, you know, we were talking about public health and HIV AIDS and all this stuff. And then we had a portion about rats kind of down in the public health section. I was just suggesting that we move that up into the sanitation section. Um, and then we mentioned possible pilot programs that could help reduce the rat and rodent issue. So to me, it flowed a lot better if we moved that And green is what I moved and red's what I added new. So green was already in there, but I moved up to sanitation. And I, I obviously, you know, Janine and, you know, is gonna sort of have the, I think the final sign off on the exact narrative, but to me that flows better. And I would like to mention um, these sort of pilot programs that have happened in other parts of the city that I think would, would help, uh, whether it's containerization and containerized composting, um, which I think if done right, would, would cut down on this issue. Uh, so I'm just gonna keep going to stop me if anyone wants to comment. Um, I can't do it. Susan, I you have said uh, so. That was those were pretty small, you know, a couple things to, uh, changes for the sanitation and the and the environment, and then if we go down um, to street activities, um, I added this. Maybe this isn't actually that relevant um, for this, um, but I'm trying to express a little bit the frustration. Um, and this, this doesn't tie again to any budget requests, but I was trying to express a little bit the frustration that the way the SAPO system's currently set up, we have no way to review certain street activities um, because if they're classified as small street events, they can submit it 30 days. And in some cases for like curb lanes, even 10 to 15 days ahead of the event. Um, which is a little frustrating for us as we're looking to, you know, have the chance to review as many events as possible. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, is this too, is this too trite to include in there too small? Uh, what do people think? I think it's appropriate. It's appropriate. We're stating our needs and I think you've stated it well. Okay. I agree. You know what I think? I think we should uh, write a letter to SAPO, uh, saying that we are objecting to what's happening, that we don't have enough time to review. Um, I think that would be more appropriate than necessarily putting in district needs here, but um, I'm okay if you want to put it in, but I think a letter should go out to SAPA. 
Well, I think Rocio is right. I think we could say in the letter as we state in our district need statement. So we're really saying it twice. I like that idea. Um, yeah, okay, let me, I mean, that's a separate discussion. Um, so I don't know if we should bring that up as sort of an agenda item in, you know, next month or, or in December. Because I would, if we're gonna write a letter, I think I'd like to discuss further with the committee, what exactly goes in that letter. And it wasn't this, really calendared on our agenda tonight. But this could stay in the district needs statement, it's appropriate. Yeah, but I, I tend to agree with you, OCO. I think it's a good idea. Um, but I think we should put that as an agenda item and, and discuss it further before we decide to write one. Okay. Then it, otherwise it's just gonna be me writing a letter, which isn't really how it's supposed to work, I think. Um, but I think we've been discussing it anyway. <laughs> we've been discussing it all the time. Yeah, but I'd like I'd like to have a detailed discussion on exactly what the content of the letter is to give everyone a chance to really have input. Um, okay, um, the, the pedestrian plaza stuff, it's kind of the same issues we had that hasn't really changed. Um, okay, so that that was it on the district needs. I, I let me just I, I know we will I had made a recommendation emails. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I, I had made a recommendation. I don't know if it's here. And that's that we say something. Oh, this was just my original one. So yeah, please remind I, I going back and looking at your email. But can you remind everybody of your recommendation? What I had recommended, and I know that this relates very much to the reopening uh, working group and the work that uh, Valerie has done, that we request of the city of New York that when rules and regulations are promulgated regarding outdoor dining and roadside dining, that they be sent to the community boards first for our impression as to what the rules and regulations should be before the schedule for public hearing. I think we have been left out of the process of planning. We do not know when we will hear anything. And I think we should say something here because we have so many roadside dining establishments in CB2, we would like to have an advanced idea of what the rules and regulations that would be put forth in the future would be like, and to have the opportunity to comment on it. So I'm not sure where it goes in here, Will, but, and I think you said in your response, it should be coordinated with the reopening group, a reopening yeah. group, but I think we need to say it somewhere here. We know that a lot of what might come through would come to this committee for review well, regarding roadside dining. So we should mention it somewhere here. We'd like to know what it is that the city of New York is planning to propose. Oh, Val, well, perfect. Valerie's on, so uh, she can add yes. her input. Valerie, go ahead. We've discussed this, Valerie, in your working group. Hey there. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we've asked for this in our uh, in our uh, letter that we sent out uh, back in March. So, uh, with our priorities for rulemaking, so we will follow up on that letter with the electeds um, <clears throat> regarding that issue. So, is it okay to mention it here as well, Valerie? Yeah. Good. Great. Um, and then Brian, I think you had one comment as well on part nine. Um, somewhere in here, right, Brian? The wording uh, where we started out by saying that the lack of enforcement seemed to imply that it made the temporary open restaurants successful. And, and there, all the rest of the paragraph and description was just saying the opposite. Lack of enforcement created a very difficult uh, situation for the uh, entire community. Yeah. So I would just reword that one line. Yeah, okay, I, I see what you're saying. I think it was trying to say that it was unable to make it a success, um, but it, read, it might read as you're saying that the lack of enforcement did make it a success, which I don't think is how it was intended, but I, I agree the wording sh could, should be made more clear. Uh, maybe even just take that line out because everything after that really says it very strongly, 
the lack of enforcement has been a problem from the be very beginning. So, yeah, maybe we just start there with um, as as the outdoor dining as the city's outdoor dining program transitions into a permanent one, and just start with as. And I think I think that's a lot cleaner. So let me just make a note of that. Okay. Okay. Um, so again, um, I'm going to keep going through. Let me know if anyone has any comments. So let me go on to the capital project. So this is what I think Carter was commenting on. Oh, Valerie, do you have anything else? One more thing to say? Or is your hand just still? No, I will lower. I will lower. Okay. I will lower. Okay. Thank you. Well, appreciate um okay so moving well, on to the well the can budget. i just say something about this um yes i find that unfortunately there is enforcement but it's not enforced evenly across everybody uniform uh, one of the, one of the things that oh we are not allowed to have outdoor dining sheds are not allowed to have music and bob gormley was consistently on everybody's back except some people refuse to abide by the rules. So if we're gonna have enforcement, it has to be even, has to be correct, has to be everyone to be penalized if they have the wrong thing. And this is not what happened. You have many places that have music blasting and it's wrong. And then the competitor wants to be able to do the same thing, but Maybe the competitor doesn't want to get in trouble. So the enforcement has to be even. Okay. I think the word is uniform. So maybe right here, lack of any uniform enforcement. Right. right. Okay. Thank you, Rocio. Um, okay, um, let's go back down to the budget. So I just put in again, that what our budget priorities were last year. And I think I added maybe one at the bottom. So this, um, I, I take Carter's point that maybe DEP, the New York City's DEP is not the one that's gonna fund this study. So um, I, I don't know about this one, I mean, we know that with uh, whatever, we don't know for sure. I mean, if the Army Corps study is going to be implemented, um, they've proposed, as I mentioned at the start of this, a $52 billion project that would start in 2030. 35% um, of that would be funded by city and state. So pre presumably, whether or not that project's implemented, there's a portion of, that's going to have to be funded you know, by DEP or by some other city agency along with state agencies. We don't know what the funding breakdown is gonna look like. We don't know what any resiliency on the west side is, is gonna look like um, in terms of specific design. Um, so I don't know, maybe we just leave this as it was last year and we take off the request for this specific study, but we leave in the general request for, uh, we know there's gonna be an eventual need for some sort of capital projects for resiliency on the west side. We just don't know what that's going to look like. So I don't know if anyone else has a view. I mean, we can just leave it as it was last year. Carter? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's not necessarily a bad idea to leave in our written document, but it's a matter of framing the question if it's something put to DEP, meaning that I'm not sure we put it on our list per se, but I think it's important to be here, you know, the point you made of framing the issue. Yeah. And the Army Corps of Engineers, it's unclear to me, you know, what, where, how far, where their, their scope of study is, meaning if it crosses onto land, for example, if it's, if it's, 
outside of that area because of the, the, these overlaps. If it crosses onto what, Carter? Sorry. Me, meaning with the overlapping jurisdictions, whether the, the, the Corps of Engineers is actually looking at solution, you know, ways to address this that are on land, so to speak. So they have, they have put in the report, um, they've drawn, I mean, I don't think they've considered any of these overlapping jurisdiction issues at all. They have drawn up to 34th Street going down the west side, a proposal of shore-based measures on land. Um, but that's, that's about as far as they go. I mean, I don't think they're aware of all of these jurisdictional issues. It's sort of in their study, you know, this is the solution they're proposing. And however you get there, you get there. Um, but they have at least drawn on their shore-based measures on land. Um, yeah, because so there's, there's th th this, and I'll just, I'll just so everybody knows. So the framework here is the questions come up. Why is Hudson River Park responsible for maintaining bulkheads, which are actually protecting New York City, right? So that's a, a question because that's generally in their budget, but it protects the city. So you start, that's an idea of a question of where you run into things. We don't want to necessarily remove this. We just don't want to push it to the city as one of our priorities to the city per se, because they'll just say, oh, it's it's not in our jurisdiction, right? So, but I think it's important to have it in the document because yeah. as New Yorkers and people who live in our community, we don't necessarily look at that, look at it that way. That's just what they respond to us because the question is who do you ask for the funding, right? And and who's responsible for it? And that's, you're never gonna get a, yeah. a clear answer, I'm, so. Yeah. I mean, I think um, now that I think about it, maybe what I'd wanna do on this one so the part that's in red, which is already in the, uh, we've already added to the district needs statement. We take it out in the specific budget request, but I would like to maybe just add a line and reference the Army Corps study and just say, you know, regardless of the form that resiliency efforts take, you know, as, as an example in the Army Corps study, there's definitely going to have to be some sort of state and local match. The Army Corps proposes 35%. So maybe just adding a little context to the budget request saying, look, whether or not this plan's the ultimate plan, there's clearly gonna have to be city level funding for this kind of thing. I, I think I'd like to sort of make that clarification. It should read some of my- Yeah, that's a, that's a good, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a really interesting and it deserves questioning because this is a huge issue to our community and it has been, but we are seemingly consistently rebuffed on it and, it is um, just as Joanna may know, just from from with Rebuild by Design. It's uh, you know this is the the stopping point wh where nothing has really been discussed within our community, and a big part is just th simply this that there's no study here, so you can't even come up with ideas, and nobody can even you you couldn't even brainstorm without knowing some of these simple things. So. It's critically important. It's just that we keep being pushed back everywhere. And the Corps of Engineers study, they may just leave it to the locals. So even though the city's contributing money, it doesn't necessarily mean the Corps would do the study. So I, it's, it's, it's not as straightforward as it might seem. No. Well, could you say something like provide funding for matching uh, um, other sources of funding for resiliency. So the city, we would be asking the city to provide matching. Yeah, uh, for, that's for, that's for, assuming. Yeah, I mean that's sort of the point I was trying to make. That's assuming that the you know I the chan I think the chances that the whatever gets done finally perfectly matches what the Army Corps put out is very low. But whether it's something that looks like what they put out or something else, clearly there will have to be local funding. You know, to in addition to whatever state and federal funding comes in, I think that's exact. That is the point I was trying to make. And that's good. We want to make that one of our budget requests that the city has a responsibility here to provide yeah. matching funds. Yeah. Again, the one the, what's proposed in the Army Corps report is fifty-two billion and thirty-five percent of that state and local. Right. So eighteen, eighteen and a half billion. Right. Um, Joanna. Yeah, I would also um, suggest if this is the right place to put it, that 
um, the funding come with the input of community members um, in the area because I could definitely see there being projects or um, programs that are kind of just assigned to the area and then it's kind of considered oh well this region got this amount of funds poured into a seawall that should protect it or something like that so you want to make sure that at least there is some call from the very beginning that there will be input and I do know that the um, like a climate and environmental justice working group is going to be part of informing the Army Corps ongoing efforts, although it hasn't been determined yet how those people will be selected. Um, and also DEP has not, I believe, responded to the Army Corps study. So they're still figuring out what their response is. And I think they're scrambling right now because they're very understaffed from from what I've heard so far. Um, and then, so I think right now would be a really good time to like raise the flag that um, CB2 wants to make sure that there is more input than maybe just the like six stakeholder input meetings that the Army Corps might host throughout the whole region. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I mean, I think that needs to be paramount. I think it needs to be a design, whatever ultimately happens, it's, it needs to be a design that really is, you know, heavily based on what the community input is. Uh, yes. Wayne. And well, I'm sorry, I'm on yeah. my phone, but I, I just wanted to throw in one other thing. The study is for what's under the ground. It is not what to do. It is to simply map all the infrastructure that is below ground so that others can utilize that information to then come up with ideas. Yes. And it's important, it's important distinction because it, can, it could be put into several different catchments of available funds to do that study, which are not necessarily tied in directly to resiliency. And so we wanna leave the freedom for that, for you know, whatever it may be. Yeah, and that's no, an think, important distinction. To, to yeah, and it's it, different from what Joanna, which is very important, but separate. I think it's two separate things. I think that's tied to this budget request for DEP funds, including matching funds, and that any kind of design, uh, you know, design work needs to have community input. And yes, the study is a separate one, which I'm still not clear if we should be doing it, making that actual request, or putting just leaving that in the narrative. Um, Wayne, did you have? Um, Joanne, I have a question for you. Should we be asking for representation on this board or committee or that, that they're putting together? Um, that's a good question. I, I can find out more and let you know. I think that still is like in its absolute infancy. Um, but as soon as I do know, I can pass that along if they, once they figure out what the, the process and structure will be for people participating. Who's who's in charge? Like who's court? Like who's coordinating this whole thing? Who's who's putting it together? Um, I believe it started like was spearheaded by a team with EDF, um, and then has built up just like a, a coalition of different like nonprofits who have started paying attention to it. But I don't think there's like a formal group that's leading it is just a generally a, a I think different like nonprofit organizations that have started looking into it um but yeah I believe EDF would probably be the primary like group to turn to um okay I let me take a crack at this one um I think we've discussed kind of what it should look like um and I'll send it around you know, once I, once I have an updated version. Um, okay. Let's see. These are just, I didn't change these, um, the ones that are in black. Um, but I didn't think we should take them out either. Um, let me know if anyone disagrees. Um, I'm just scrolling through these. I think that was really the only one that I suggested editing. And that's that's basically it. 
So the other ones that we had that I saw last year were, um, were uh, had to do with um, with sanitation. So um, better pickup schedules, rat proof containers, improving trash removal. I think that's still a big issue for sure. So we should leave that in. MOME, I think we had that ranked pretty low. Uh, we did hear from them this year for the first time in a long time, which I thought was useful. Um, this is still an issue. Um, I think they're understaffed like every other agency, but we should certainly keep it in. Um, green infrastructure. Um, we should leave this in, I think that's still important. Uh, we have very little in our district. Um, and then looking at composting we had in last year, I know they're doing a pilot program in Queens. Um, that's all that we had that really touched our committee. So does anyone else want to add anything else? I think my view is we should keep each of those again for next year. Okay. okay. Um, all right, I, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I will take a crack at sort of a final version of this and send it to everybody. Uh, and obviously I'll send everyone the draft resolutions as well. Um, I think that pretty much does it. Um, does anyone have any other new business to bring up before we adjourn? Did I miss anything? Oh, we didn't, sorry, Rocio, you had a question on one of the FYI renewals. I think it was about the uh, Thanksgiving dinner. That's the Bowery mission. Um, I don't remember seeing that one before. I think that was one of the questions, right? Was it? Um, yeah, I, 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 I believe we had checked, um, checked back through and I think it was a, an event that's happened in the past. So it went to FYI renewal. Um, if that's wrong, we can always have them come next month, but let me, let me just check. Um, I don't think it's in CB2, Will. This is another one that's out of CB, okay. Oh, because it's on the east side of- Exactly. CB, CB3, right? I don't know why these keep showing up in our queue. Okay. I think, that's I guess- I didn't remember it. you <laughs> haven't seen it. Right, right. I guess as long, I guess the, 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 the safe applications, the, the problem is they don't distinguish between which side of the street it's on. So we're getting some of these. Okay. Oh, we'll just take that out then. No, no wonder I didn't recognize it because we've never done it. I've been on this committee for 22 years. Okay. We will take that out. See next, next year, OCO, then I'll have a comprehensive knowledge of everything that's happened because I'll have been chair for a year. <laughs> I think you already do. <laughs> You've been great. So, Thank you so much for all the work you do. Right. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, this Thank was you, a, a late one, so I appreciate it. Late for our late for our committee, not well, not late well, compared to maybe some others. Even members of the public think you've been we doing a great job. Late. Well, oh, thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, mo do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. And so, I, I heard I heard a second. So thanks everybody for joining. Thank you. Um, thanks to the thank committee. You. Thanks to the board. Thanks to the public who stayed on as well. Have a good night, everybody. Good, good night. night. Great meeting night. you all. Bye. Bye.